Joining me now is Sky News contributor Kosha Gaida, and we'll get to Benjamin Netanyahu, who's addressed to Congress shortly. But first, this is the latest attack ad against Kamala Harris that the Trump team has put out. It's all about just how radically left her voting record has been in the Senate and some of the far-left positions she has promoted. If you thought Joe Biden was radical, just wait until you get to know Kamala Harris. She's dangerously liberal. I am Kamala Harris. My pronouns are she and her. You know, for far too long, the status quo thinking has been to believe that by putting more police on the street, you're going to have more safety. And that's just wrong. You're confident this border's secure. We have a secure border. We're not going to treat people who are undocumented across the border as criminals. That's correct. People who are in convicted in prison, like the Boston Marathon bomber, on death row, they should be able to vote. I think we should have that conversation. Abolish ICE. Yeah. Is that a position that you agree with? Listen, I think there's no question that we've got to critically re-examine ICE, and we need to probably think about starting from scratch. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is new darling of the party. She has seen minutes this weekend proudly calling herself a radical, and she's promoting policies like saying that every single carbon emission in the country, every car, should be eliminated within the next 11 years, everything from a 70 to 80 percent tax rate. Do you agree that she could possibly, in this ideology, of the socialist left could splinter your party. No, you know, I think that, um, I think that's fantastic. Kosha, how's she going to distance herself from some of those positions and present herself as, as a moderate, as a centrist? You know, the race is on to really frame her in the next two weeks because to a lot of people who don't pay attention to the weeds and the ins and outs of politics, they don't know. It's sort of a, a blank canvas that she mm -hmm. has had a long record. Uh, I think how she distances herself is she's going to get a big assist from the media. We're seeing that happen right now already. She might even signal one or two positions a little bit distanced from, from Biden, potentially. Mm -hmm. But the, to me, the bottom line is this, that she there's organic popularity and synthetic popularity, and she has never, ever had organic popularity. She's always achieved less than 1% of the vote every time she's run for anything. But she is about to be the beneficiary of the greatest synthetic popularity we've ever seen. <laughs> Cover girl treatment... Uh, record shifting and cleansing, as you mentioned. And I would not even be surprised, Rita, if we see potentially her elevating to the actual office, if they go all the way and push Biden out or convince him to resign, and th she actually assumes the mantle of being the first female president and just what that's going to do uh, to this race. It's going to be very close. Well, that'll be interesting, because uh, Biden addressed the nation today. It's the first time we've seen him since he went off to recover from COVID and then announced that he wasn't seeking renomination. Uh, do you think he can be pressured to step down? Because as an incumbent, she would be in even a better position to, to win than as the Veep. I do. I was somebody who was kind of 50-50 on whether he and Jill Biden would eventually be successfully pressured to step down or not. But once that happened, to me, the logical endpoint is that uh, it could go all the way. And at the right time, whether it's the October surprise or any other time before that, if the goal for the Democrats is to win the election, what better way than to elevate her to the actual office of president, first female president of color, and um, just all the the tailwinds that that would confer upon her. So I would not be surprised if we see that between now and November. And they're trying to present her now as this great uh, law and order figure, the prosecutor and Trump's convicted felon. But let's not forget, it wasn't long ago, we're talking back in 2020, during the Black Lives Matter riots, she was raising money for a group called the Minnesota Freedom Fund, helping thugs get back on the streets. Uh, people who were rioting, people who were behaving uh, violently. And some of those people who were released went on to commit more heinous crimes, including murder. And Kamala thought the BLM mayhem was a good thing. They're not going to stop. And that's, they're not, this is a movement, I'm telling you. They're not going to stop. And, and everyone beware, because they're not going to stop. It is going to, they're not going to stop before Election Day in November, and they're not going to stop after Election Day. And that should be, everyone should take note of that on both levels, that this isn't, they're not going to let up, and they should not. And we should not. The climate has changed. You could get away with that sort of rhetoric in 2020. No one would say boo about BLM despite their terrible track record. But now 
people understand uh, how destructive that, that time was. How is she going to get away from advocating for more? Yeah, I think that's going to be one of her weak spots for sure in this, and especially in Minnesota where they had a referendum and an election since then and voted to bring back more funding for, for the police. Also in California, where she comes from, Proposition 47 happened under her. She presided over that, which decriminalized uh, crime below $900 into a misdemeanor from a felony. So all these things are going to come out. They're going to run those ads in those states, in Minnesota specifically, which is now a swing state. Uh, and I think she's just going to have to blow with the wind and somehow couch it differently. And, uh, you know, we'll see how effectively she'll be able to but, do that. But like you said, she will have the majority of the mainstream media backing her, rewriting history, rebranding her as this great prosecutor. Uh, and uh, I think, yeah, you're not going to hear a lot about this unless you're, uh, I don't know, watching this program. Now, let's talk about Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's address to the US Congress today. He invoked Winston Churchill in his impassioned plea for more arms. In World War II, as Britain fought on the front lines of civilization, Winston Churchill appealed to Americans with these famous words, give us the tools and we'll finish the job. Today, as Israel fights on the front line of civilization, I too appeal to America, give us the tools faster and we'll finish the job faster. He also made references to the anti-Israeli demonstrations that erupted across D.C. in the lead-up to his address, calling those who support a free Palestine as idiotic followers of Iran. The anti-Israel protests that are going on right now outside this building, not that many, but they're there and throughout the city. Well, I have a message for these protesters. When the tyrants of Tehran who hang gays from cranes and murder women for not covering their hair, are praising, promoting, and funding you, you have officially become Iran's useful idiots. One of those useful idiots for Iran was far-left Congresswoman squad member Rashida Tlaib, who held up a paddle with the words war criminal on it for the duration of Netanyahu's speech. Uh, but at least she turned up, Kosha. Neither Joe Biden nor Kamala Harris greeted Netanyahu when he arrived on American soil, and more than 50 members of Congress skipped his speech today. That's not the sign of a great ally when, when a country is at war. Indeed. And, you know, I think the harsh reality of it for Netanyahu and Israel is there really is a fracturing in both parties in terms of the level of support for for this war now, not October 7th and the atrocities and the hostages that are still there, but what to do now, how much U.S. involvement monetarily, militarily should go. That's on the right. And then on the left, as you point out, Rashida Tlaib and, and all of them, they have a huge fracturing where you've got a big part of the left of the, the political base mm -hmm. that she represents and others out there doing these protests. They're against this additional support. And that's a, a tightrope that Biden and Harris are trying to walk. And that's probably why they decided to just avoid the whole thing, because they're trying to appeal to two factions in their base, um, but I'm not sure avoidance is something that signals strength. And it was curious that uh, Harris didn't actually jump on the opportunity to look more presidential. Well, last week during the uh, Republican National Conference, they started the conference with a prayer for the hostages. Uh, the, the, that issue was very present throughout. There were parents of hostages who spoke. Mm -hmm. um, I will be very interested to see what happens at the DNC, whether there is anything approaching that level of support for for Israel because that fracture yeah. within the left is deep and, and they've got members of their team who are openly anti-Israel, who are openly anti-Semitic, some of them. It's a good point and it'll be very telling about which side is more powerful in mm. that base. Now let's go back to Kamala and the Democrats are desperately trying to rebrand the historically unpopular Kamala, Kamala Harris. Uh, the latest attempt involves gaslighting us into thinking she was never actually made border czar and that many, many of the uh, problems that we're seeing with illegal immigration have got really nothing to do with her. Axios tweeted an article claiming that Harris never actually had the border czar title, suggesting Trump and the Republicans are peddling disinformation. That's odd because Axios themselves reported her appointment 
to the border czar role in 2021 and referred to her as such in subsequent articles. It's this Orwellian levels of rewriting of history, Kosher. And it's not just Axios. It is so many mainstream publications. There's uh, side-by-side articles of what they reported then, what they're claiming now. And again, if you're not deeply politically engaged, you'd read the headlines now and go, well, this is a smear. This is not this is not Kamala's fault. But for X, which is the one wrench in the whole memory hole apparatus, because that is what it is. In 1984, they were burning newspapers and <laughs> tossing them into physical holes. Now you can delete and rewrite headlines, you know, with the a keystroke from a, a keypad, mm. and that's what they're going to do. But for X, the community note on that was really funny, where they were <laughs> posting the original articles, you know, from the very same publications yeah. that said that. But again, you know, this race is on, this battle is on. And for low information media consumers, which this election will turn on, which narrative is going to get cut through is what we're going to see in the next 90 days. Now, let's uh, talk about that rebranding. That what Part of that is also painting her as as cool, as this Gen Z, uh, I don't know, edgy candidate, uh, invoking singer Charlie XCX. I don't even know if that's... Is that how you pronounce it? You just... I think so. I think I'm dating myself too. Uh, th th saying, you know, she's got this brat design for, for her Kamala headquarters Twitter page and... They're even reclaiming her famous coconut tree speech, which she has been mocked for constantly. And they're hailing her as a TikTok phenomenon. But actually, among young voters, some of that research is showing she is wildly unpopular. This poll has her trailing Trump 58% to 39 amongst voters aged 18 to 34. And... I think that's what you touched on, that Trump's popularity is more organic. It's not manufactured. He's got YouTube superstars like the Paul Brothers. He's got the UFC fighters. He's got the uh, hottest comics around like Theo Vaughn and Andrew Schultz backing him. Mm -hmm. uh, while this brat Kamala summer thing seems to be really forced and, and carefully manufactured, mm -hmm. but she is trending on TikTok, and I don't think that's by accident. I think everything that trends on TikTok is a decision someone's made. Yep, algorithmically or otherwise other strategies, the, the black magic of that. It is fascinating, this organic support versus synthetic support is very clear who has which one. And it is funny that Trump, who's almost 80, 79, um, is organically popular with young people. <laughs> uh, not many 79-year-olds would be, so that, you know, credit to him for that. And it's not as easy as just putting in somebody young. I think Kamala is 59. That doesn't automatically translate with her appeal. She looks people. much better than 50. She does not look her age. She and, does. We've got to give her credit. she can dance. So I'll give her that <laughs> We'll much. give her credit uh, for that and maybe that'll come through on TikTok. Kosher Gator, thank you so much for your time this Pleasure. evening.